Good afternoon. We're just waiting for all the participants to join uh, the meeting and we'll crack on in about uh, one minute or so. So good afternoon and uh, welcome to uh, the Freeman Air and Space Institute's launch of our latest uh, paper, um, The Integrated Review and UK Space Power, The Search for Strategy, um, authored by Blethyn Bowen, uh, who is with us today uh, to uh, speak about his uh, paper. Um, we have two discussants uh, who will be following Blethyn's opening uh, remarks. Um, Peter Watkins, who's a visiting professor at King's College in London, um, a fellow at the London School of Economics and was formerly Director General Strategy and International Policy at MOD after a long career, including time as head of the Defence Academy, uh, which uh, King's contributes a uh, significant contribution, makes a considerable contribution. We're also joined by Catherine Courtney, a non-executive director and strategic advisor and former CEO of the UK Space Agency. What a fantastic uh, post or, or CV to have uh, this week of all things. Uh, she chairs the Global Network for Sustainability in Space, bringing together scientists and industry to help safeguard future space operations. We're going to run this uh, um, on the record. Uh, the event is being recorded and will be live streamed to YouTube um, whilst we're doing it. There's a link uh, to the paper um, posted in the chat function of this uh, Zoom meeting uh, if you haven't yet received it. And we'd ask when we've had the opening remarks for you to post your questions, not using the chat function, but using Q and A, please. Without further ado, since this is a, a short meeting, um, I'll step back as chair and invite Blethyn to introduce his uh, paper. Blethyn. Uh, thank you very much, John. I'm um, just uh, checking the time here on the side here. Right, uh, so I'm going to talk for about 10 minutes or so and hopefully stick to that uh, time limit. Uh, thanks very much to John and uh, thanks also to everyone at the uh, Freeman uh, Air and Space Institute for putting this event together and also um, for the uh, support in, in writing uh, this, this paper. Um, so um, hopefully this paper uh, will give everyone some food for thought um, on how to think about British space strategy and the links between the more military elements of UK space power and how they may fit with the wider space, space portfolio across the UK. So um, I'll just start off by outlining some context as space is a very new field to a lot of people, uh, especially in the um, national security or defence or international relations communities. Then I will pose some key questions um, which I have in the paper and which guide my thinking really about space strategy in general, but are also applicable to the United Kingdom in space. And finally, I'll just provide some of the key recommendations at the end with a few um, comments and remarks as well. So all of this can be found in more detail in the paper. Um, so this is really just to give you a very brief overview and um, just as a flavour of what's, what's in the paper itself. So um, just a bit of context to start with. Um, I think it's fair to say that in the last 10 years or so, space has, be has come of age within Whitehall um, 2010, of course, saw the foundation of the UK Space Agency, which um, congealed a lot of the various um, space activities and sub-departments across Whitehall in the civilian and industrial um, aspects of outer space. And since then as well, we've had a lot, we have had a string of documents come through from Whitehall, including from the Ministry of Defence, um, on space doctrine, um, a, a space primer as well, the military space primer. Uh, we also had the first national um, space security policy and the national space policies halfway through the 2010s. Um, and we were also um, due to have a defense space strategy and also a national space strategy um, promised to us that, that are forthcoming as well. Um, we also have a new director of space role in the MOD now as well. So there's a lot more activity going on um, across Whitehall uh, in, in space. And, and um, 
despite that, however, um, I, I still think there's a lot of work to be done in terms of properly connect, connecting various parts of space to some sort of overall strategic objectives, as you'll see in the paper um, and also in, in my wider research and publications um, in, in this field. So despite sort of the, uh, the more attention that um, the, the UK government has put on space, um, we still very much feel like we're in the early days um, and, and some sectors um, really have a, um, a lot of sort of um, basics to get right first. Um, before sort of um, um, moving on to very ambitious projects, as we see in a, in a lot of commentary, um, um, especially on, on, on the internet. Um, so a, a starting point as well, I think, is to recognise that Britain's position is very much in a binary context. Um, it's dependent on allies for a lot of what it gets in space um, across the board for the most part. So um, the UK is integrated a lot with the United States in terms of military and intelligence space activities and um, platforms and assets and services. Uh, and the UK is highly integrated on the commercial, industrial and civilian side with the European Space Agency and, of course, um, uh, the European Union, uh, which uh, has been in the news a lot in the last uh, few years. And, and that general situation isn't going to change anytime soon. The UK is in that sort of... Um, a dependent and integrated situation in space. So anything Britain decides to do in space has to start from that position based on what do we already get from our allies that we can continue to rely on them to do and what do we actually want to do ourselves then that maybe for whatever reason we don't want to be reliant on others for. So those are sort of key fundamental questions and the answers to those aren't always obvious. Um, so there has to be a lot of thinking about what the pros and cons of each are and where we can actually rely on allies or even participate with allies in new joint ventures as well. Space is very expensive and the UK has limited resources, as everybody knows, and um, not least of all in some of the headlines that have come out this week. Uh, resources is all, always, always an issue and space is a, a particularly expensive thing to do, um, especially in terms of space-based presence. So. The other starting point as well is that in terms of the military and security uh, element, the UK has a very small presence in orbit. In terms of space-based assets, the UK doesn't actually have that much of a, of a big presence in space. Um, in terms of security and defence, um, Skynet is, is sort of the flagship um, space programme for, for the Ministry of Defence, which is um, um, operated by Airbus at the moment, and uh, um, the initial contracts for the next generation of Skynet have now come online. But uh, that's about it, really, in terms of direct um, sort of sovereign assets that the British have in space. Um, the UK does a lot of other stuff in terms of space situational awareness with the Filingdale's radar, for example, and participates a lot with the integration of space technology into terrestrial military forces, um, partly because the UK is such a close and integrated partner of the United States in the military as well. Um, so the UK does do a lot of stuff on space in terms maybe more on the ground-based infrastructure rather than based in space. So when we talk about putting more British sovereign assets in space, we have to be clear that there's a lot um, of stuff um, um, that we need to start with, maybe on the basics first, because we do have a very minimal presence in orbit at the moment. Um, so, and it's worth bearing in mind that a lot of other European states do have more sovereign assets in space in terms of military satellite communications, intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance, etc. The UK has been able to rely on the United States for much of this for the past 60 years, uh, which is partly the reason why the UK um, has traditionally not invested in a lot of space-based assets for um, security and defence purposes. So a bit on some of the key questions um, that sort of guide my thinking about British space strategy in particular. Um, is what does the MOD need to do today to respond to the proliferation of military space power around the world, both to friendly militaries and also potentially hostile military forces? And also what does the MOD need to do to respond to anti-satellite or counter space uh, technology proliferation? So those two big trends are happening now in the wider world and the MOD needs to be responding to those and also um, the, the wider British state as well. So um, if there's a shooting war in space tomorrow, the, there could well be civilian infrastructure um, consequences and space is a critical infrastructure as, as, as defined by the UK government. So there are clear um, uh, issues there that need to be responded to. And the answers to those aren't always in space either. There can be a lot of uh, responses to those various uh, trends. 
And, and following from that, a key question, of course, is what essential space power assets or services um, that the UK could or should invest in on a sovereign basis um, and that also can't be provided by allies or we do not wish to be dependent on allies for. Um, and um, I think um, you'll see the detail of my thinking through on that, um, but in the paper I try and outline perhaps low-hanging fruit that might be desirable areas for investment if space is going to have any significant investment at all. Um, and that would be in um, secure military and government satellite communication, so perhaps expanding Skynet or building another kind of secure SATCOM capability might be attractive. Intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance satellites um, would be a potentially useful system, especially when in a crisis um, every state or all our allies are possibly going to also have a high demand on their ISR systems. So could there be bandwidth issues where how, how confident are we that our needs will be a priority for our allies in a major crisis? And the other element is um, space domain awareness, formerly called space situational awareness. So building assets and capabilities just to know what actually is going on in space. So building a, a better intelligence picture of space activities and having a better awareness of the space environment itself. And I think those in some ways represent um, a way for Britain to learn to walk before running in terms of military space power. And those seem to me like um, lower hanging fruit than some of the more ambitious and very, very expensive um, uh, investments in, in outer space that um, we've seen some suggestions for in the, in the press over the last sort of few months and a couple of years. Um, so just to uh, finish off, because I realise my 10 minutes is fast running out. Um, in a nutshell, um, the first recommendation I have really is that in general, the UK should really only aspire and can only really aspire to be more for, for more operational freedom um, in an acute crisis or in, or in military um, operations on Earth, um, rather than strategic autonomy in space. So in something a bit like the UK nuclear weapon system, um, in the moment, it's it's a British independent control system, but strategically we are reliant on others for the construction and maintenance of that system. But in an acute moment, it is still um, something that is under the control of the United Kingdom. So space is similar to that. We are going to be strategically reliant on others uh, for a lot of space activities, you know, the Americans and the Europeans and possibly other allies around the world, like the Australians and the Japanese possibly as well. Um, but we can still have some assets that can make a difference for British operational uh, freedom within particular crises. And uh, so, so that's sort of the general recommendation um, that sort of comes out in terms of how ambitious can and should Britain be in terms of military and security space activities. Uh, second, um, space power needs clear terrestrial priorities. Um, a lot of discussion about space happens in a vacuum, um, excuse the pun, um, in that what happens in space doesn't happen in a political vacuum. Space systems have to meet clear terrestrial, political, military and economic needs. So those investments, any big investments in space has to, has to satisfy clearly defined needs. And if the, um, the UK doesn't really have a clear idea of what kind of wars it's preparing to fight, then we'll have a much harder time figuring out what kind of space systems are the best ones to invest in because there's no point talking about investing in space in general. Space is big and so is the space sector. So we need to be clear on what kind of space capabilities are best suited for what kind of terrestrial military capabilities. And that has to follow from clear terrestrial priorities. So, um, and, then, and then that will also require clear and um, robust and enhanced relationships with all our allies. Um, so the United States, NATO, um, the European Union and the European Space Agency to name sort of the most important in, in that regard. So we have to remember that Britain is not exceptional here. We are a fairly um, sort of normal middling power in space. There's a lot of other technologically advanced but also similarly financially restrained um, um, space powers that also ha that are having to learn to share and integrate to do the cutting edge military space stuff. So the UK can't do a lot of this stuff on its own and it will rely on allies uh, for it. Finally, I also have some points on, on the National Space Council um, and how we have to be wary of a lot of documentation about space policy because we don't have a sea policy, we don't have an air policy, 
space policy as well doesn't really make that much intuitive sense when the military space world is very very different to civilian or industrial planning in space so one space policy document will be very hard pressed to have a coherent policy that speaks to all of that and we um, the national space council i think can play can play a very constructive role in coordinating the very diverse sectors of space activity in the uk um, but I would be very cautious as to what any single space policy can re can be expected to achieve when spa the space sector or space sectors are very large and diverse and do very different things. So it's very difficult for one document to cover all of that <coughs> in any detail. So I will end there. I know I've run over a little bit. Uh, thanks very much. And I look forward to the questions. Levin, thanks very much indeed. And of course, the uh, this event was, was uh, scheduled before we knew that the uh, announcements on, uh, of yesterday were, were going to come out. Now I'll turn to Peter Watkins to uh, to act as our first discussant. Peter. So, um, well, um, first of all, I'd like to start by congratulating uh, Levin on a, I think, a very clear, comprehensive, and if say so, slightly excusing the pun, uh, rather down to earth account of the UK's approach to space power, both military and civilian. And of course, as you said, John, his timing was impeccable, uh, coinciding with yesterday's announcement on a multi-year settlement def for defence, in which space power was highlighted rather prominently. So, um, as I mentioned when I spoke uh, at the launch of the Institute in September, as the MOD Director General responsible for strategy, um, I argued that defence needed to become more aware of its reliance on space, to invest more in space-based capabilities and strengthen our international collaboration in space power. And I'm pleased that Blevin's paper acknowledges that there was at least an uptick, I think was his word, uh, in space-related activity in that period. So I'll claim all the credit for that. Um, but the key word, of course, in Blevin's paper is strategy. I have to confess that that was and remains a work in progress. But before getting to his specific recommendations, um, I note that the basic thrust of his argument is for a realistic incremental approach which builds upon our existing strengths and relationships. And intuitively to me, this seems absolutely right, even if, as he hinted, it's not necessarily very fashionable. And that point about the binary dilemma that he made um, between the military and intelligence linkage with the US, but the industrial and commercial with, with Europe, I think is a very good one and one that we really have to take into account. So the core of Blevin's argument, I think, is captured by his first two recommendations. Uh, the first one being that the UK should not aim for strategic autonomy in space. And I, and I agree with him. I mean, from the defence perspective, at least, that is no more realistic than for any other domain of defence, and he mentioned nuclear. Um, greater operational independence is both, to my mind, more attainable and, frankly, is a prudent objective in a rather uncertain world. And similarly, his second recommendation, UK space power must meet terrestrial needs and priorities. I mean, like nuclear weapons or cyber, space-based capabilities are not the substitute for conventional terrestrial capabilities. They can enhance them, they can com complement them and so on. But they don't alter the reality that conflict is still ultimately about the control of people and ground on this planet. And I do think, um, well, first of all, I think it's a little bit difficult, and he might come back to this, to expect the MOD to be very precise about what sort of war it's going to fight. Because frankly, we don't know. Um, and, uh, you know, the past is littered with examples of, a, of us preparing for what's under the wrong war. So to some extent, we have to um, hedge our bets. And I'm afraid that means that the investments in space capability will have to be similarly hedged. But I think the MOD does get this point because um, I think that's actually indicated in a perhaps slightly back to front way by its current focus on what it calls multi-domain integration. Space isn't something that just, or cyber for that matter, that sort of exists independently from the domains. 
I won't go through all the recommendations. I've touched on the two core ones already. I'll just dwell on two, if I may. Recommendation five, that UK military space operation be realized and a space power culture developed. And recommendation six, that space power relations with the US, EU, NATO, etc., should be maintained and enhanced. I mean, frankly, I'm a bit skeptical about recommendation five. I mean, the MOD hasn't yet managed to rationalize its helicopter and commando forces. So space seems a bit of a tall order. And does it really matter? Um, and I'm, you know, I'm wary of taking sides in MOD turf wars. I spent too many years avoiding that. Um, but my sense is that actually a coordinating responsibility would sit more comfortably with the Royal Air Force than UK Strategic Command, mainly for a reason which is highlighted elsewhere in the paper, the importance of international collaboration. Aid for space in the Five Eyes and other key countries tends to be with their air forces. I would put more weight actually on the second part of that recommendation, which is develop space power literacy across defense and Whitehall. Space-based and related technologies are among a set of advanced technologies that are challenging our thinking on national security and even economic diplomacy. And officials are not sufficiently versed in these technologies. It's an argument, in my view, for a new approach to learning and development across the national security community which hopefully may yet emerge from the integrated review when it's published next year. And finally, I do see international collaboration as essential as Blevin does. So while yesterday saw the announcement of the multi-year uh, budget for defense, integrated review, as I said, will not appear until next year. And the cabinet office paper published in the middle of August said that the government's vision for the UK in the world was as a, and I quote, burden-sharing, problem-solving nation, unquote. And I think that fits very well with um, the approach to space power which Blevin advocates, and perhaps you might say more on that. Also, the recently published integrated operating concept for the armed forces talked of our forces being, quote, allied by design, unquote, a tweak on the concept of international by design in the 2015 uh, review. So building on the extra money announced yesterday, I agree that the UK should now be actively seeking opportunities to collaborate on space power, starting, I would suggest, with NATO. So I agree with Blevin that the approach that the UK took on cyber in NATO is a good model here, but that did involve investing quite heavily in a critical capability, offensive cyber, and then making it available to the Alliance. And that step and prompted other nations to make their cyber capabilities available to NATO. But I suppose my point would be that this can't be done in isolation from our general approach, a sort of reverse cherry picking. You know, here's some of our nice assets, would you like them? Um, we have to take a, you know, a general approach around that, those words allied by design. And I'm afraid we'll, we won't see uh, a few more weeks and months exactly what that means. So thanks very much. Peter, thank you very much. L lots to think about there, and I'll, I'll give Blair then a chance to uh, to respond to some points after we've heard from Catherine. If I could ask you, Catherine, to make your remarks now. Uh, thanks, John. I, I would also like to uh, echo Peter's uh, congratulations. I think it's a you know a very well articulated uh, paper, also making practical suggestions and setting up straw men arguments, um, which is you know which is what we need uh, is more dialogue around these things. Um, I do uh, have to also say that I agree with the recommendation that uh, A, we need to have some strategic vision about what our priorities are. I understand that doesn't mean that we, can, we shouldn't be building general capabilities so that we are um, future-proofed a bit when we, you know, we don't have the crystal ball uh, to know exactly what the requirements are going to be. Um, I also agree with the recommendation to focus on our strengths um, and to leverage those in our um, bilateral relationships. And uh, I would, of course, uh, say, you know, your, your, strength, your, your reinforcement of strengths in SATCOM, uh, space domain awareness, and ISR. Uh, I agree with those as areas where the UK um, 
you know, certainly punches above its weight and has the opportunity to build on, on capabilities and skills uh, that are already here within our industrial base. Um, and particularly, uh, I am interested in uh, the space domain awareness topic um, because I think that that spans across civil and defense. Uh, I think it's, you know, we're all living in this uh, pandemic environment and uh, I, I think it's time that we start looking at those uh, other risks on, uh, on the government's top 10 list um, and having mitigation strategies in place uh, and the impact of uh, major events in space on that, that can uh, undermine the capability of our space assets, both um, civil and, or sorry, uh, defense, security and, um, and uh, commercial, it would have a critical impact on our national infrastructure and our economy. Uh, and I think it's quite important actually that we focus efforts on a joined up view about what space domain awareness needs to be in the future. Uh, also, I personally feel that this is going to be a very growing large global commercial playing field. Uh, and when we talk about building capability to meet defense needs, uh, you know, the best way to build that capability, unless the uh, MOD is going to be the only customer in town, is to uh, build strengths in markets that are going to be growing markets globally in the future, uh, so that UK companies can um, export and so we can attract inward investment. Um, there's sort of uh, two areas that I'm interested in, and I'm going to leave them with you and you can uh, answer them if you want, but I'm going to launch right into questioning. Uh, so one is a bit around this question of sticking to the knitting and building on our strengths. Um, I agree that with budget constraints, you know, we can't boil the ocean and we should be quite clear about, you know, what we're leveraging in terms of today's relationships and today's capabilities um, and how to maximize those with smallish budgets. On the other hand, the reason that the UK punches above its weight in, uh, for instance, SATCOMs today is because strategic decisions were taken decades ago uh, for research, funding, um, and to enhance the industrial base in that area and to become, you know, to allow UK companies to become major players um, in that space. So I think there's a question in my mind about how you you know, have a bit of a long-term strategic vision about capabilities that will be required, and how do you promote innovation in those areas uh, and not just stick to today's knitting? Because I think otherwise you risk uh, the UK finding itself on the sidelines when the major developments, you know, of 20, 30, 40, and 50 uh, come out of the pipeline and uh, we haven't brought our strong innovation base to, to bear on those. Um, and then I do want to pick up at some point in this conversation about your recommendations around reinforcing our relationships with the European Space Agency. Uh, and I entirely agree uh, in terms of the leveraging of the value of participation in those programs um, historically and going forward. Uh, you know, certainly um, the UK has been able to achieve a huge amount of growth through its participation in those programs. And while I'm the first one to echo that it's a member organization, uh, you know, we subscribe to it, it is not, an, it's not the EU, we can uh, comfortably leave the EU and continue to be, have a leading role in ESA. The reality is, is that the EU provides the biggest chunk of ESA's budget. And leading EU member states are our um, biggest national competitors regionally. And the European Space Agency's own direction of travel and its future priorities are very much shaped by their agendas. Uh, and uh, everybody isn't always playing nicely together. So while the industry in this country is clamoring for a very much beefed up national space innovation program uh, to, to, I guess, uh, has a counterweight against our uh, investments in ESA. I think I'd like to hear your views, Blevin, on, um, you know, you, you've kind of ignored that, that point about, well, should we, you know, should we continue to boost our investment in ESA? 
or should we put more money into a domestic program? Um, and with but constrained budgets, I think some of those choices are going to have to be made. So I'd like to hear you cheerlead a bit more for ESA, but also address some of those more difficult issues around the continuing ESA relationship. Catherine, thank you very much indeed. Really, really interesting from both both you and Peter. I'm going to give uh, I'm going to give Blethyn, uh, about two minutes to, <laughs> to to maybe come back because I'd like to turn to some of the questions as well. But we, you'll have a chance to sum up at the end as well, Blethyn. But but just so we can get to some of the broader chat uh, questions. But if you want to respond to Peter and Catherine now, uh, um, take take the chance. All right. Thanks very much. Um, yeah, thanks for taking the time to, to read this. And uh, thanks very much for the comments, um, uh, the kind comments and then also the questions. So um, working my way backwards um, on ESA, um, I've sort of, this is really is beyond the scope of the paper. Um, so given that ESA is not sort of directly in terms uh, involved in terms of a lot of UK military space planning and, and um, thinking um it's is sort of beyond the scope of what was reasonable within the paper but in terms of the actual issue you're, you're asking about um brexit has has sort of upset the balance that the ESA and the european union had developed in terms of how does ESA function as an independent entity whilst the eu becomes sort of one of its well its biggest single uh, contributor and um it's it's not the case right now that i think that it's a matter of the eu getting its way in isa the members of isa and the eu they have different opinions as to where they want a potentially new eu space agency to go because some of them like the way isa works right now and they're quite skeptical over you know what does this change in relationship mean for our success to, our ability to win certain contracts and because we know how to play the isa game um and, and the eu game changes it so um there's no sort of i haven't seen consensus really on the continent in terms of what they think about where the eu is going with a potential new agency but britain needs to be involved in that obviously from the ESA perspective and Britain I, th I think um, Britain was right to increase its budget to ESA recently in the last two three years um, and if Britain wants to have a better say in what the trajectory of European space is both EU and ESA it has to be very influential in ESA both in terms of actual money but also diplomatically as well so it has to be more involved to, to, to keep that influence so it's through ESA that Britain really can help hope to directly influence EU space as well because they are so intertwined. Um, on the other issue, uh, promoting innovation, um, I, I guess, I mean, that would have to come through uh, well-costed uh, feasibility programmes and uh, getting the right experts in to decide, you know, what's a reasonable amount of expenditure, what are the benefits for military, civilian industry. Um, so, um, um, but I think we have to make sure that we don't think of innovation all the time when there's a lot of proven stuff out there that Britain can do or even improve on that have been done by other states that won't cost the earth either. So there's always a balance between getting what works, getting what's good enough, and also doing the exotic stuff that might be good for a while. But also, if you develop something that's amazing and innovative, it won't be long until other people copy you as well. Um, so, so, I mean, Anyway, that's a massive topic. <laughs> I could spend a lot more time talking about, but I'm, I'm fairly optimistic that with the right people and processes, you can manage both well enough, I would think, but it's about the right people. And, and that comes on to the point with Peter Watkins in terms of rationalising with UK Space Command. Um, I like to think that there should be somewhere in the MOD where the buck stops at space. And that's what I like about the new director of space role in that there is a coherent sort of geographically orientated um voice within the mod in the same way that you cannot you know you have the land culture maritime culture air culture uh, and i see sort of a more congealing and rationalization of space um it doesn't have to be space command but some form of saying well what is the voice or who is the voice of space in the mod and having that space centric perspective is what's important um i'm, I'm pretty ambivalent really as to what will happen with space command because details are so scant right now so we'll see how it goes but um but i think regardless of your bureaucratic setup if you had the right people making the right decisions then they can also make the most of what bureaucratic structures are in place but that's maybe me being too optimistic perhaps um putting agency over structure maybe um 
I think there was one last uh, point. Yeah, I think the cyber issue in NATO, I think that's a good example to think about what the UK can do. I think the UK can um, be really useful for a lot of other NATO states in learning how to integrate space power into terrestrial forces, especially when it comes to how do you plug into the American space military empire because you know the americans in space are just so massive and are operating in a completely different league to what most european militaries are doing so i think the uk can help a lot of um, the other nato member states who may not be as integrated in terms of cutting edge space military integration to learn from the british experience for example so off the top of my head that would be a really clear way for britain to lead a lot in nato in terms of um, space enabled force modernization across the alliance Bevan, thanks very much. Um, I think we'll try and run to about 20 past one um, if, if the panelists can stay with us. And um, I'll turn to some of the questions uh, in the Q&A. Uh, Sean O'Connor was first asking if we are going to, is the UK is going to be operationally independent, but still add something of value to a coalition, where should we spend our first pounds to make a difference? Um, I think the MOD has already spent some of his first pound on, on certain ISR technologies, so um, uh, synthetic aperture radar uh, for one for one thing. Um, so, I mean, again, that's something like uh, that's a proven technology uh, as well, but it's about doing it cheaper on smaller platforms and um, sort of new ways of doing it. And I think ISR is a particularly attractive one because um, even though that we get a lot of that from allies already everybody gets hungrier for that sort of data when a major incident happens. So, um, you know, unless we are absolutely certain that this particular kind of ISR capability is one that we're not going to run out of bandwidth from our allies on it, uh, we're always going to get our tasking done as a matter of priority, then, okay, we don't need to do it. But my impression and standing is that that, as well as satellite communications bandwidth, especially in terms of secure satcoms, are areas that always just get... Um, um, consumed in terms of uh, the capacity to handle them in a time of crisis so in terms of resiliency redundancy as well that's another attractive area um and 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 those are areas that will carry purchase with other allies and which will give britain more influence at the table um uh, alongside countries like france and germany that do have significant isr assets in space where with the british don't um and the italians as well and they have existing um buy and trilateral agreements on space intelligence sharing so if britain right. did more on that we could do more um get more uh, purchase there thank you um alan antrobus uh notes you made some good in in recommendations but often political ambition appears to want more for less how does the uk or how do we educate political leaders to move in a coherent direction and at a realistic pace I guess that's a question for defence policy in general, really. Um, space is not immune from it. Um, I, I, I guess that, um, I mean, I, I don't have a clear answer, answer for that. That is a really difficult, and it's a societal uh, question and about a state strategic culture too. Um, but I think that we have to be very careful in um, having generalists not getting distracted by the shiny stuff, perhaps. So space has a challenge in that space power is mundane, everyday, pretty, it's about logistics more than anything. And, you know, that's not something that grabs headlines. You know, it's not like, um, you know, aircraft, um, you know, striking an enemy position or tanks running around Salisbury Plain or, you know, ships doing stuff at sea. Nobody really sees satellites and the effects they have on warfare is through data. <laughs> so, so I think, um, but everybody knows that a rocket goes whoosh, <laughs> and and most people's only visible interaction with space power has maybe been they might have seen a rocket launch somewhere at some point. So I will I will caution against some of the more flashy stuff because um, I get asked about you know space investments and they always want to talk about say space launch. I'm like okay, but that has sort of very specific uses in specific ways maybe not so much for defence, for example. Um, whereas there's a lot of other stuff maybe we should be spending money on instead um, that aren't as spectacular, um, but they're not as exciting as a rocket launch. So and I think- in, you're, you're carefully not mentioning that the Prime Minister mentioned a launch uh, coming up in Scotland in his, uh, in his introduction yesterday to the- uh, Yeah, I was puzzled by that statement um, because um, UK space launch is not, has never been sort of explicitly tied to defence needs. And for a lot of the satellite systems that the MOD might be interested in building, they can't really be launched by the kind of launch capabilities that the UK is investing in. That's always been for more industrial and civilian purposes. 
obviously we hope uh, that FASI will make a contribution to uh, improving the, the quality of debate and to reach the, the parts that that, that space discussion hasn't always uh, managed to do in the past. Uh, moving on to Ben Sharp, uh, he refers to your low hanging fruits uh, section, uh, SATCOM, ISR and SDA all undergoing significant commercial growth. Do you believe operational freedom can rely on commercial actors or is government owned the only, only way forward? Um, I wouldn't say it's the only way forward, but um, what the UK will be doing will be based on the successes of the British private space sector over the last 20 years. Um, the reason why the UK space agency was set up was uh, because of the successes of um, various British space companies um, over many years previously in, in setting up those especially small satellite capabilities, but also other space services and products um, across the board. So, um, so I do foresee a significant um, private participation in a lot of any new um, space-based capabilities for the UK. The actual relationship um, is beyond my knowledge because I'm, I'm not an expert on public-private finance or, or the interface between private capabilities for MOD needs, so that, that is beyond, beyond my understanding. But, um, but again, it's about if you have the right people and the right skills, um, then that's what that that's what matters. I imagine you can get maybe the private sector to do something faster, but then will it give you the kind of capability you need? But there are also certain areas where you need people in uniform to be doing certain things. You need people with the right uh, clearance, the right service culture, or the right you know bureaucratic culture to integrate those systems into the military or the intelligence sectors. So there are going to be areas where even though it might cost more money or it might take a bit more time, there might be compelling reasons to do things in-house rather than outsource. But um, uh, Catherine raised the important point about the civilian side, you know, space situational awareness is, is an area that may not be done by the military. And we're looking at moves in the United States now to get um, to move um, a lot of space situational awareness or SDA away from the Pentagon and into um, is a commerce, I think. Um, so civilianizing those capabilities because it's so ubiquitous. So maybe the UK, you know, might not find that if the MOD, they might do the new SSA or SDA stuff. Um, and it's worth remembering as well that RAF Filingdales is first and foremost part of the ballistic missile defence and missile tracking system rather than a space situational awareness or a space radar. Um, so, so yeah, so it, it depends on case by case basis, but there's a lot of potential for both um, public in-house stuff and um, private sector uh, provisions. I mean, on a similar theme, uh, Julia Baum, who was recently awarded the uh, FASI Space Studentship uh, and, and, is, and is going to be researching this area, asks about space power extending beyond ISR and SDA, and she refers to higher hanging fruits. Uh, will they move into space developments, exploration, expansion, and resource exploitation? Or do these missions not serve goals and priorities of long-term UK space power? Um, I would stay away from uh, off-world resources. <laughs> um, that's very much um, sort of very, very long term. I mean, I'm not sure I live to see that sort of stuff on any large scale. Um, so, I mean, the, the problem is with, with space is that there's a lot of dreamers in space and that doesn't necessarily help um, sort of the concrete planning about the logistics and data systems that we need from space, the sort of more mundane stuff. Um, and, and also space is somewhere where uh, most people are ignorant as to the military and intelligence history over the last 60 years in space. They still see space as an area that's really about science um, or about exploration, you know, the space station or various probes to the, to the solar system. Whereas they don't know much about the actual orbital infrastructures in Earth orbit, which is what we rely on every day. And also sci-fi is a very important part of people's thinking of space and they tend to get carried away with it. And that's what's happening with a lot of the cis lunar commentary on space in lots of uh, especially American national security blogs when they talk about space power. They get way ahead of themselves. They're talking about, you know, um, stuff that belongs in the expanse novels and TV series, not in concrete military planning today when we're just talking about machines in Earth orbit because beyond Earth orbit, there's nothing strategically significant or economically valuable happening. It's, it's, it's about science exploration, stimulating certain parts of industry, and of course, techno-nationalist propaganda. Thank you. And Moira Andrews asks, what can be done to improve the mutual understanding between MOD, Space Command, and UK Space Agency on the development of a 
genuinely joint civil and military space strategy. And perhaps I could ask Catherine to also pitch in on this on this question. So I'll start with Blethyn and then Catherine. Ooh, that's a tough question. <laughs> um, I don't have a, a, a simple answer to this, but um, we'll have to see what the National Space Council does. So that's sort of the big change here. And we'll see whether it can um, relate those AHEs together um, and, and figure out the processes for doing it. And I, I think that there has to be recognition that the sectors in space are very different. They do come from different worlds and that whilst coordination is, is important and that um, given the limited resources of the British state that, um, you know, there is a coherent idea at the very top and of what's going on and you know the Chancellor and PM would have to sign off on any massive, massive investments that would affect all sectors. I would be worried that we tie the civilian and military stuff too much uh, and contaminate each other because they do different different things they focus on different things um so i'd be afraid that if you get it wrong that uk space agency might unduly influence um military intelligence priorities in space but also vice versa that you might over militarize what uk space agency is doing so so any overarching policy document or control has to get that balance right um, and what we're seeing in france for example now is splitting now between CNES, the civilian space agency and the mod the french mod is taking on more space now as they're becoming more sort of in, invested in direct military space capabilities so so it doesn't mean that coherent that congealing things at that level is always the right option but we'll see what the national space council does because well we have to give it time to see uh, how, how well it coordinates things thanks catherine um well to say that there the fact that there is a national space council uh is a big step forward to have some you know strategic decision making body uh instead of just leaving the mod and the agency to sort of duke it out over what the priorities are and and where budgets go um i think there has been a very strict divide the uk space agency you know is at great pains always to say that they are the civil space agency and yet, actually, um, it, it, it's not possible um, if your remit is, is the growth of the sector, in part, uh, is to you know, fund the science and, and research that leads to future capabilities. You can't draw this absolutely black and white line between civil and defense. So I think the answer is, I agree with you, Blevin, um, that they shouldn't be blurred. You know, It should not be that space command takes over uh, and sets all the priorities and requirements for civil space and vice versa it should not be blurred you know on the space agency side um, what what actually works in practice is relationships and and strong channels of communication you know and collaboration between the two it does raise the big question about dual use assets which we haven't touched on and you haven't touched on your paper and we and is you know out with the scope and we haven't got time to discuss but i think uh, onto what ben had said it's a very interesting question whether budgets can be spread further and faster uh, if there is collaboration bringing requirements together across the defense and civil side um, you know and that requires good partnerships between those two sides Okay, thank you. Um, we should talk quite a few questions. I'll try and take a couple, a couple more and then we then we'll have to uh, allow the panelists the, the last word. Uh, Tom Hickey asks on European cooperation, what would be the most viable format large scale multi country partnerships or working bilaterally trilaterally with a few dedicated space partners? Would you perhaps envision a Lancaster House style treaty with France focusing on space? Uh, that's a big question, <laughs> a difficult one as well. Um, with, with that, I mean, I, I, I struggle to think of a major space investment that would happen that would involve allies that would not be done through either ESA, which would not be military because it's ESA, uh, not directly, um, or it would be, do, be done through the EU. So, I mean, with France especially, um, space is done with Europe and ESA and the EU, especially and the EU is becoming more of a significant military space power provider for its member states, notably through the Galileo navigation system um, and um, 
um, Copernicus, which uh, is not just about the Sentinel satellites, but about better coordinating the Earth observation capabilities of its member states. So, um, and of course, with the increased space surveillance um, interest from the EU, as well as um, government satellite communications as well, the, the direction of travel is there for the EU. The only negative thing that you could say about the EU is that it takes a long time to get there. So, if France is in a hurry to do something, then maybe it might want to do something outside of ESA EU structures. But I, I would think that anything requiring large procurement will be done through the existing EU ESA space industrial channels. Um, and as far as I can tell, NATO is not making any noises about any significant direct space assets of its own either. Uh, NATO is more about interoperability and coordinating its member state space um, dependencies and activities more. Thank you, Blaine. Um, I'm sorry we haven't got time to go to uh, every question, and many of them are, are really excellent. I'm going to uh, invite Peter, Catherine, and then Blethyn to make, make some final remarks, and then we'll wrap up the session, which is um, overrun, which is a good thing because there are lots of questions to answer. And if you want to answer any of the questions in your final remarks, please feel free to do so. So, Peter first. Well, um... I just underline the point that I think has been made is I don't think it's realistic to think in terms of a very sharp sort of military uh, civil divide here. I mean, I think that's increasingly the case. You know, there's a whole range of new technologies emerging which have both uh, civil and military applications. But that doesn't mean that you throw everything together. And as, as somebody was saying or suggesting, you know, have this new space command sort of setting civil policy as well. But some degree of convergence, I think, is, is inevitable. Um, second point is on international collaboration. I think there'll be very, there'll be many different models. And, and I think that's what we're again, we're seeing across the defense field at the moment with increasing um, what some people call minilateral models, small groups of like-minded countries getting together, um, doing various things under the NATO banner, for example. So I think we need to be very pragmatic um, and very quite agile, um, but to make sure if the UK wants to have the influence that we're in as many of these groups as possible. That's Thank, all you, from Thank you very much. And Catherine. Uh, thanks. I just I want to make one sort of final observation, which is that uh, I think some of the rhetoric over the last few years has mirrored developments in the US and the US defense space posture was very much shaped uh, by the Trump administration. And I think, you know, the, in terms of what the UK's bilateral relationships with both the EU and with the US uh, should look like and how those will evolve over the next coming years. Uh, we need to watch how the dust settles from the Brexit negotiations because there's a lot of posturing around that at the moment and we need to see what the priorities of the Biden administration are uh, for US defense space capabilities and so you know we are living in interesting times I guess is my summary on that one. <laughs> Thanks very much. And the last word goes to uh, Blethyn. Uh, thanks. Yeah, just building on the point um, uh, about the civil military divide. Yeah, it's, it's never absolute, um, but it is important to separate duties and responsibilities according to sectors because their focus and attitudes will be different and their priorities will be very different and the cultures they develop as well. Um, but we have to be aware that um, what we do uh, in terms of tying uh, the civil military space together um, or the dual use of space technologies, it is being watched by other states, but also um, there's a lot of commentary, especially in the English speaking space expert world about say, the, the, the military nature of China's space program when China has a lot of civilian and you know arguably benign space activities which are not militarily orientated but of course as we all know the PLA does have a large role um, to put it mildly in the Chinese space sector as a whole but it doesn't mean that everything that China does is a threat in space um, in the same way that in with the Americans not everything that NASA does um, uh, is purely civilian 
there's some stuff that NASA does that does have military implications or military potential and also a lot of stuff that happens from the intelligence agencies and the military um, elements of the US space do have civilian uh, applications or benign applications as well so so you know the civil civil military dual use aspect is is a bit of a um, Mobius strip but is important in how we talk about it and separate responsibilities within you know practically speaking within any any state um, and it's still very problematic when people think that space is is has you know is still being militarized now. Well, it's always been militarized. It has been since the dawn of the space age. Um, so militarizing space, people complaining about certain countries militarizing space is like saying, well, um, you're making the sea wet. <laughs> so like, well, space was always this. Um, and um, I think on the last point um, that when we talk about British ambitions in space, they are very much part of the larger defence problems in terms of the rhetoric tends to go beyond our actual resources and willingness to do it. So there has to be a lot of caution and seriousness in what we choose to do in space um, because there will always be the lofty rhetoric. Um, but if you look at the patterns of rhetoric in terms of security and defence policy, the rhetoric you have to get used to, you have to pay attention to where money is being spent and where it should be spent. And it'll be quite modest as it is across the entire defence uh, portfolio. Then thanks very much. I mean, the one thing that is clear from, from the last 24 hours is that I think uh, contrary to some people's expectations, there are going to be a number of integrated review uh, uh, rollouts in, in, in the new year uh, now that the, the financial piece has, has been announced. And I think the policy area is still very much in play. And I'm very grateful to you for this, this important and, and, and significant contribution to the debate. Um, I hope as many people who are attending this can, can dip into the paper. It's really very accessible, readable, and makes some, some, some very interesting and challenging points. And I'd also like to thank uh, Peter Watkins and, and Catherine Courtney for giving up their time and uh, engaging with the paper. Uh, and to the questioners, uh, who, who uh, we're going to sweep up the questions and we'll try and make an attempt to maybe even answer some of the areas that haven't been answered. Uh, but thank you very much for joining us today, but especially thanks to Blethyn for an outstanding paper. Thank you very much indeed. Good afternoon. <laughs>